This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. The Weekly Journal, or British Gazetteer, published this, the first newspaper notice about the case of Mary Toft. From Guildford comes a strange but well-attested piece of news that a poor woman who lives at Godalming, near that town, who has a husband and two children now living with her, was, about a month past, delivered by Mr John Howard, an eminent surgeon and man midwife, living at Guildford, of a creature resembling a rabbit. The article provides what will become the standard explanation for the deliveries until it's finally exposed as a hoax two months later in mid-December. And that explanation came from the mouth of Mary Toft herself. As this article goes on to explain, the woman hath made an oath that two months ago, being working in a field with other women, they put up a rabbit, chased a rabbit, who running from them, they pursued it, but to no purpose. This created in her such a longing to it that she, being with child, was taken ill and miscarried, and from that time she hath not been able to avoid thinking of rabbits. This version of the story, being told in October 1726, was repeated by Mary Toft in November when she was questioned by Nathaniel St. Andre, one of the doctors who attended Mary Toft. He published his report of this exchange in the first of many pamphlets published on the case, though in this version the story is much more detailed. Toft gave the following account. On the 23rd of April, she said, she was weeding in a field with other women. She chased a rabbit. It was reported that, quote, this set her a longing for rabbits, being then, as she thought, five weeks gone with child. The women charged her with longing for the rabbit they could not catch, but she denied it. She then dreamt of rabbits and had, quote, a constant and strong desire to eat rabbits, but being very poor and indigent could not procure any. 17 weeks later, so we're now in the middle of August, Quote, she was taken with a flooding and violent colic pains, which made her to miscarry of a substance that she said was like a large lump of flesh. Three weeks later, so this is the beginning of September, she passed another substance. But she continued to exhibit what she described, or Saint Andre described as the symptoms of a breeding woman. At this time, as she worked in a hot ground, milk flowed profusely from her breast, though she added, as she had had children before, she thought she felt very differently from what she used to do. And then on the 27th of September, she was taken very ill, sent for her mother-in-law, who in this account she describes as a midwife and a neighbouring woman, and finally voided, that's her word, what she apparently described as parts of a pig. Following the delivery of further animal parts, she was churched and, quote, thought all was over with her. Underlying this story, and it was, of course, as I'm sure most of you know, a story believed by several respectable doctors of the time, was the theory of the maternal imagination. Women's thoughts, in particular their thwarted desires, could affect their unborn child in physical, direct ways. And Toff's case seemed to offer doctors proof of this theory. John Howard, that's the Guildford doctor, was joined by other doctors in Godalming. Mary was subsequently moved to Guildford and then finally to London to allow easier access for the many men coming from London to see her. And so it was that Mary Toff found herself in Roger Lacey's Banyo, which is the scene of William Hogarth's famous print, which is published at the height of the case on the 22nd of December. Lacey's Banyo at number 27, Leicester Square, or Leicester Fields, was a fine establishment. It had the joint third highest rateable value in that stretch of Leicester Field properties, lying in St Martin's in the Fields. Before Lacey, the house was occupied by Lady Margaret Watson. Before Watson, it was occupied by the Earl of Rockingham. Number 28 next door was occupied by Sir Christopher de Bouvery, a director of the South Sea Company. And at the north end of the square, of course, was the house used as a royal residence for the Prince of Wales at this time. So Lacey, and therefore Toft, was surrounded by wealthy country families, the titled and the royal. The next three weeks saw a remarkable gathering of very different people crowding round her. 
Toff's family members, her husband and sister-in-law, a group of local women from her neighbourhood, at least five doctors, several of them in the pay of the King and the Prince of Wales and his wife, a JP, several titled men and, as if this weren't enough, a steady stream of the public. It was reported that most of the people at Guildford had been to see her and every creature in town, both men and women, in London. It was in the Banyo in Leicester Fields that Mary Toff gave the first two of three confessions as part of an investigation into a case of imposture. Once she was charged, she was committed to the Westminster Bridewell, that's on the 8th of December, and there she gave the third confession. Even there, infinite crowds came to see her, such was her notoriety. And her notoriety stemmed, of course, from her alleged delivery of the rabbits. The case prompted a short but sharp pamphlet debate in which doctors debated that theory of the maternal imagination. Some doctors heralded the case as a medical wonder, others were more cautious. As the case was exposed as a hoax, a new wave of print culture ridiculed them all for their incredulity, and that's the context for Hogarth's print. In the process, Toff was cast as a scheming evil woman who had set out to hoodwink all of these men. So it's not surprising that historians have examined the case with this medical context in mind. In trying to read the case and its significance, historians have focused on changing attitudes towards reproduction, and cultural and literary scholars have produced some important work on monstrosity and the self. And if you know any of my completed work, that's the sort of work that you would expect me to do as well. But I don't think this is the most revealing approach for the case, and in this paper I'm going to try and do something a little bit different and therefore a little bit courageous for me, so be kind. Um, so I want to explore different um, contexts for the case, and these are essentially the context of place and social relations. The family, neighbourhood, parish, town, county, metropolis, and perhaps, if I get time, the more virtual context of nation and that public. My approach is indicated in the title of the paper, and of course it's a reference to E.P. Thompson's book, Wigs and Hunters just in case no one, someone hasn't read it. This classic of social history sought to expose the legislative innovations of early 18th century Whigs as instruments to protect their own property against the actions of groups of armed men, the blacks, who went about trying to steal deer and threatening violence against people and property. Thompson's account differed from other interpretations that presented the blacks as a legitimate cause for concern amounting to a national emergency. Thompson concentrated on the areas of the southeast where George I liked to hunt. The act that the Whigs brought in to deal with this situation was the Waltham Act, or the Black Act of 1723, which extended capital punishment to a much greater range of crimes. It was fairly quickly being applied to a wide range of actions that exceeded its original focus, and that focus was, originally, groups of men armed and in disguise. The work examines the micropolitics of social conflict within a larger canvas of social class and national politics. And this approach is something I'm going to try and attempt in the paper. But Thompson's account of early 18th century society is relevant to the Toff case, not just because of its method, but also because it links to the Toff case in concrete ways, I'm going to suggest. Thompson was concerned with weird responses to the blacks, gangs of men who stole deer from royal forests. To be sure, Mary Toff gave birth to rabbits, not deer, but I'm going to argue that the case was closely connected to the social tensions in the southern counties that Thompson articulated so powerfully. So let's move from the Banyo to Mary's town of birth and residence, and that's Godalming in Surrey. So Godalming was granted incorporation as a town in 1575. At this point, the inhabitants were described as being in most extreme ruin and decay. Out of a desire to promote the town to a better state, Queen Elizabeth granted the corporation and thus made the inhabitants of the town into a body corporate and politic. By 1725, Godalming was estimated as having a population of between two and 3,000. And it had changed considerably since the incorporation. Though the woolen industry had brought prosperity to the town, this was actually in decline by the early 18th century. 
Mary's husband, Joshua, was a young cloth worker and was affected directly by this decline. Mary herself, as I mentioned, was working in a hop field as a day labourer at the time that the whole affair began. As she suffered the onset of the miscarriage that, for her at least, marked the beginning of the entire affair, she had to leave that place of work to walk through the town to her house. It's evident that the town itself was zoned, as we would expect, and the Toffs lived in tenements away from the market house, which is where the richer um, people in the town lived, and towards Bridge Street. And so what you see, and I know people in the audience will know this street very well, um, that's the market house that you can see at the end, that's the white building. Um, that's a 19th century market house but it is on the site of the 18th century market house that was put up in, in, uh, in 1729, it was, it was refurbished. The hot field where Toff was working is the other side of that. Toff had to walk down this street, uh, this is just facing the other, other direction, to the end of, of this street and take a left up to Bridge Street where she, uh, where she lived I think. Mary Toff described this walk, which she said was not above a quarter of a mile, and that's about right, uh, as taking her two hours um, because she was experiencing the miscarriage while she was doing this walk. So the Toffs were part of Godalming's poor then, and they were spatially set apart in the town. Dennis Todd, who's actually a literature scholar but has done the best historical research on the, on the case to date, has noted that the large group of Toffs in Godalming, some of whom were certainly related to Mary and Joshua, became less wealthy over time. This is illustrated by a number of wills that, that he looks at and by the fact that from 1729 you see Toffs dying in, in the Godalming workhouse. And this is a slide just to illustrate really the, the poverty of, or the relative poverty um, experienced in uh, Godalming compared to the rest of the county. So this is Surrey. Um, the, the end of that arrow, the tip of the arrow points to Godalming the town. The area in red, I need a pointer but I don't have one. Um, so this is the hundred of Godalming. Uh, sorry, that's the hundred of Godalming. You can see that most of it is coloured in red, um, and what that means is that over, uh, sorry, 45 to 55 percent of households in those parishes were exempt from the hearth tax. This is obviously 1664, but I've already told you that um, Godalming's economic situation is in decline after this date. So, if anything, things are getting worse. Mary Toff's family circumstances are critical to understanding the case. Mary was born on the 21st of February 1703 to John and Jane Denyer. In 1720, aged 17, she married the 18-year-old Joshua Toft. They were both very young for marriage in a society where the average age for marriage was nearer 24. Their first child, Anne, was born in March 1723, though I think she died in July that year. The birth of their son, James, followed less than 12 months later in July 1724. So at the time of the hoax, Mary had given birth to two children and had just one still living. A third child, Elizabeth, was christened in February 1728, though after the rabbit affair, and this child must have been conceived very soon after Mary was released from prison in April 1727. So within weeks, she'd conceived her third child. And that's also her last child. She only, she only has two living children. Mary's parents, John and Dame D Jane Denyer, had five children, of whom Mary was the second eldest and the oldest girl, and this may be why she left home so early to marry. Her maternal family is almost entirely missing from the story of the case. I think, think that's peculiar given the events that followed. Joshua Toft, Mary's husband and senior, as I've said, by only a couple of months, was the sixth of 12 children. Joshua Toft's mother, so this is Mary Toft's mother-in-law, was a key figure in the whole affair, and particularly in Mary Toff's three confessions, which, as I said, were taken in the bagno in early December 1726. Now, I don't have time to discuss the confessions in, in very much detail. I am going to spend a few minutes just, just talking about what I think they show. Um, but just to give you a flavour of what the documents are like, um, historians haven't used these documents, and I think that's 
partly because they're very difficult and they're very complex. They were written down by the doctor, James Douglas, in whose papers they now survive in Glasgow. But they were legal documents given in the presence of the London JP, Thomas Clarges. They were therefore part of that criminal investigation in which Clarges is trying to explore, um, get to the bottom of the hoax. He wants to find out who the instigator is. So they're heavily mediated documents, and you can see this. This is the first page of the first confession where she starts, I will not go on any longer thus, I shall sooner hang myself. In the next paragraph, she starts to talk about her um, monstrous birth, but you can see immediately that there are crossings out and lines inserted between lines. Um, you can see how messy they are. I think this partly reflects the speed that, um, at which Toft is um, talking um, and the amanuensis Douglas trying to sort of go back and capture everything that she's saying. But it's also, of course, reflecting the fact that she's being interrupted, she's being asked questions. And this is a page from the second confession, just, and it illustrates that really, really nicely, I think. So a cross and a line, a horizontal line, marks a break. It, mar it marks a moment where the JP, the justice, has, has interrupted Mary Toff's flow. So you can see what I mean when I say that they are mediated and they are complex. Um, oh, and finally, yeah, I just wanted to show you these. So these are fair copies, two versions, um, two fair copy versions of the, just the first confession. And I won't, I've got a whole paper about the, the, um, the, these documents, and I, I won't go into any detail, but just to say that these are tidied up um, versions of the first confession, although they're rather faithful to the core details, I would say. But they, they just suggest how how useful actually the, the rough copies really are and how much detail that, that they give um, as compared to these, to these fair copies. It's also worth mentioning that these confessions were extracted under what Richard Manningham described as a very painful experiment, under the threat of a very painful experiment. And these confessions, Mary Toff's three confessions, are not consistent. Confession one blames a mysterious shadowy woman, the wife of a knife grinder, for the hoax. While in the second and the third confession, Toff blames her mother-in-law and the Guildford doctor who first attended the birth, that's John Howard. But there are remarkable consistencies between these documents. One of the most striking findings from these confessions is what they reveal about the critical role of networks of kin and neighbours, and in particular the role of women in the life, and indeed the hoax, um, of Mary Toft. There were women gathered around Mary at every stage of the hoax. Um, in amongst a number of depos other depositions taken as part of the case was that of the widow Mary Coston of Godalming, who was, who was hired as a nurse for Mary Toft until she went to London. The confessions mention the neighbour Mary Gill, Betty Richardson, another neighbour who's forced to remove a piece of animal um, from Toff's body because Toff was in such pain, and a Mrs Mebbin, another local woman. To the women that are mentioned in the depositions and Mary's confessions, we might add the shadowy women that feature on the periphery of the male doctor's vision. So Richard Manningham, who also published a book on the case, mentioned in passing that the movement of Mary's body was so violent during her pains that, quote, as I sat on the bed in company with five or six women, it would sometimes shake us all very strongly. This all brings to mind not just the ritual of the lying in or the birthing ritual, but also the 17th century bedside conflicts reconstructed by Laura Gowing, in which older and authoritative female kin and neighbours practice what Gowing refers to as the intuitive experience touching that was identified with midwives and sexually knowledgeable women over the bodies of younger women. And in so doing, these authoritative women um, restated their authority in the family and in the wider community. <coughs> By her account, at Mary Toff's bedside, none of the women seem to offer her any assistance and their practices have an altogether more sinister tone. Another consistent element of Mary Toff's confessions is her description of her mother-in-law, Anne Toft. She is a figure of authority and she is also frightening. Mary Toft um, uh, deposed, I was loath she should touch me. 
Anne Toft is repeatedly described as a midwife in the confessions, though I can't find any record that confirms this. She's not one of the three women listed as midwives in the parish registers. Um, and if she did work as a midwife, this would have been on an unofficial basis for, for poorer women, which wouldn't be uncommon. Anne Toft certainly had extensive experience of pregnancy and labour herself, having had 12 children over 23 years. For her young son and daughter-in-law, she must have appeared a formidable woman. And it's indisputable that Mary Toff was frightened of her. What Anne Toff thought of Mary, I can't say. Her relatively new and young daughter-in-law had lost a child three years before. She had one child the year later, but the latest pregnancy had ended with a miscarriage. Mary Toff deposed that her mother-in-law had, quote, told me that I would do it and go through. I should get a good living and be ruled by her and not tell of her. Of course, Mary Toft had good reason to deflect attention from her to others whilst being interrogated by the JP. But for me, there's no doubt whatsoever that the hoax was initially, in some way, a way in which I can't quite nail, a product of a family in which power relations around the reproductive history of Mary Toft had somehow gone awry. The reproductive lives of such families were policed from without as well as within, though. A wealth of scholarship shows that poor families like the Tofts were increasingly subject to the regulation and intervention of local governors. Naomi Tadmore has recently underlined how important the policing of procreation and women's reproductive role was in this larger development, as parish overseers and increasingly the vestry sought to manage the growing burden of poor relief. As inhabitants of Godalming, the Toff family was subject to no less than four formal systems of governance and regulation. As a town, life in Godalming was regulated by the corporation and its office holders, the self-styled principal inhabitants. The oath for those newly elected into the company and society of the wardens and company of the principal inhabitants bound these men to uphold and maintain every lawful liberty and constitution made for the benefit of the corporation. These men govern the town in different ways. Christopher Friedrichs mentions Godalming's town clock as typical of the way in which towns regulated the everyday life of their labouring inhabitants. The clock was so that apprentices, servants and workmen could keep fit hours. The corporation also upheld strict rules of conduct by close observation and detailed record keeping. Nothing was overlooked, nothing forgotten, says Friedrichs. The Godalming Corporation operated through meetings and courts, as well as using other forms of regulation for their own purposes. In a petition sent by these chief inhabitants to the Surrey Quarter Sessions in 1724, we can glimpse some of the values of these men, as well as the processes they used to uphold them. The petition complained that Stephen Boxall of Godalming had threatened to indict or otherwise trouble and molest several persons as disorderly and abusive to him. But in fact, the 42 signatories attest those persons are quiet and peaceable, and it's Boxall who was envious, turbulent, a disorderly man. The peaceable neighbours are willing to live quietly, the signatories um, declare, if Boxall would let them alone. It was these men who policed the town for its economic and moral well-being, raising funds for bridge repairs, for example, but also bringing disorderly residents, those who weren't peaceable, to the attention of the courts. The second form of regulation, of course, was through the parish. Toff resided in the parish of Godalming, um, and Godalming Urban, if you want to know. The parish provided relief for the poor in the form of regular pensions or irregular dole, but receipt of such relief required parishioners' conformity, not just to formal rules about settlement, but also to expectations of appropriate behaviour. Though a small town, by August 1726, there was already a workhouse in Godalming. The workhouse was a form of relief, but it was also something that the poor wanted to avoid. In 1734, so a little way past the hoax, residents of Godalming's almhouses, bequeathed and run by the Carpenters' Company for Poor Men, complained to the company that they could not subsist without having further relief and that the parishes would not maintain them without going into the workhouse. The company answered that the men would get no more provisions and if they couldn't subsist, then they should leave and enter the workhouse. The company represented an informal, an informal form of regulation for the gondoling poor, in fact. The third form of formal governance was the manor in the family of the more Mol and more Mol Molyneux of Lowsley. 
The manor had its own courts, the court leet or frank pledge and the court baron. These courts comprised tenant juries who enforced bylaws relating to rent, property and crime, but also the behaviour of the tenants who might disturb the peace of the manor or bring the reputation of the lord into disrepute. As Brodie Waddle has recently shown, these courts still played an important role in monitoring community behaviour well into the 18th century, and his research suggests that urban manor courts were more active in policing unruly behaviour than rural courts, and of course, in Godalming, we're talking about a small town. Lastly, there was the court of the Godalming Hundred. Godalming was divided into nine tithings, each consisting of a group of ten householders led by tithing men who sought to maintain good conduct. The court of the Hundred comprised these tithing men, and by the 18th century, by the early 18th century, this was overlapping with the manor, and the records of the manor and the Hundred are actually kept together for this period. So, I know that's sucking eggs for a lot of you, but I want to make four points about this local governance. First, whilst each of these structures of governance was focused on particular issues, they converged on issues um, around maintaining the peace and disorderly behaviour. We can put this in the context of a great deal of recent work that shows how such institutions govern the intimate lives of families. And here I'm thinking of the work of uh, Keith Wrightson for Whitting Withington, Steve Hindle, for example. Second, together, these structures of governance created a comprehensive and very tight web over the two to 3,000 inhabitants of the town. Third, the groups of men holding office in each of these structures overlapped. In other words, a very small network of men governed Godalming. And I'll get to four in a moment. But I just want to spend a few minutes talking about these networks. Now, um, I wonder if we can get the lights at the front off. Can we do that? I think we can try. So I don't need you to read the names. It's OK that the names are illegible. What's important is that you can see the colour. Um, oh, thanks to... Oh. Oh, that, now that's, that's great for the slide, but... <laughs> oh, OK, well, um, OK, just, could you just lower it for a moment? So, OK, let me do this without the screen. Oh, I wonder, hold on, hold on. Uh, I wonder if I can get a light something. No, I can't. OK, I'll, I'll, I'll go off piste. So, so, OK, so what's important is the colour. So the eight columns to the left, and I, oh, bless you, thanks. So the eight columns to the left, um, whoa, hold on, yeah, the eight columns to the left show office holders or jury men from the corporation, the manor, or the hundred. The final two columns represent more informal groups, and I'm using them to represent the principal inhabitants of the town a, a bit more generally, so not office holders, but, but principal inhabitants. So the penultimate list, you might just be able to see it, it says Petition Against Boxall. That's the petition that I've just been talking about against Stephen Boxall for being disorderly that went to the quarter sessions in 24. The final list is subscribers to the marketplace repairs that happened in, in 1729. Um, so uh, what do I want to say about this? Yes, as it says, the key, um, red, a name in red means that that name is repeated across the lists. Um, and what's immediately striking, of course, is that many of these, most of these names actually are repeated ac across the list, across these lists. The correlation is least strong for the first two lists, the list to the furthest, to, to the left. Um, those are the manor courts. But there's quite a concentration for the hundred and the corporation, as well as those final two informal lists of principal inhabitants. Um, so, and now I just want to move to that fourth point, which is this, and that's that the Toft network, as far as I can reconstruct it, is almost entirely separate from what I'm calling this governing network. And for this, we need to look at a couple of other lists. Oh, I'm sorry. So, I didn't talk about these two lists, but I do need to talk about these two lists. Um, <coughs> hold on. Yeah. So, um, these are lists of householders or, or ratepayers um, in the town. And again, the key is the same. So, the red, um, it, that's a name that is uh, repeated in the governance lists on the previous slide. Okay, so there's some correlation, as you would expect between the um, rate-paying inhabitants and the lists of governance on the, on the previous slide. 
Okay, but then to the TOF network. So we need two, two other lists for this. So this is the first. So um, this is a list of men who appeared at the Guildford Sessions in July 1726, charged with trespass. So in terms of chronology, this is after Toff's miscarriage. It's three months before the rabbit births start appearing. But in terms of the whole hoax, if you, if you measure that from the miscarriage um, to the end of the year, we're, we're sort of in the middle of, of the hoax. Um, and crucially, this list includes Mary Toff's husband, Joshua Toft, cloth worker. This case involved a large number of local men charged for a trespass in entering the ground or the pond of James Stringer, covered with water with an intent to steal fish. So they were caught wet. We might expect these men to represent a rather different group in the town, um, and, and as I've suggested, they do. The names in green are those that appear um, on the on any of the other lists, yeah. So the, the names in green. Let me just show you the names in green on this list um, are the ones which tally with the governance lists or the principal inhabitants or the um, the rate paying lists. Also on this slide, okay. Um, so trespassers as householders. There are four trespassers governors. There are only two names on this. Um, uh, it, um, recognizance at the sessions, um, only two names here which, which appear on the governance list. Um, so in other words, let me just go back, so in other words the correlation of those on the sessions recognizance with either the lists of governance or householders is relatively weak when compared with the correlation between those other lists. So the men bound to appear at the sessions were relatively unconnected to the networks of power in the town. The second list I need to mention um, for reconstructing the Tofts network is one that I don't actually have represented here. Um, it, it's a list really which consists of, of the group of deponents who were called upon by Baron Onslow, local landowner, to give statements about the case as he investigated the case locally. So these people were Edward Coston, a framework knitter, Mary Coston, Mrs Mason, Mary Pato, the wife of John Pato, Richard Steadman, a weaver, and John Sweetapple, a courier and a Quaker, um, the, the deposition says. The names in blue on this sessions list are those which appear in this smaller list, the list of those who gave uh, witness statements to Onslow. So um, the people who gave depositions to Onslow, I think, were surely very close to the Toffs, either in terms of their relationship, they were friends or kin, or proximity, living very close to Bridge Street, where the Toffs lived. Two, the two names which appear in the list from the recognizance were Richard Steadman and John Pato, as the slide um, says. Steadman is the only name that appears in the Toff network, the recognizance, and any of the other lists. He's a householder in the early 18th century paying rates. So overall, and this is the big point, overall then the Toff's network of neighbours was part of a separate group and excluded from the networks of power in the town. Thank you, Tim. Okay. So it'd be very easy then to see Godalming ooh, as a starkly divided town on the basis of this data. And this would be supported by the wealth of scholarship on the increasingly marked divisions in small towns and parishes between the poor and an emerging middling sort of office holders. We should be careful to note though the small degree of overlap between the two groups that I've started to sketch out to you. It's not the case that either group was stable. So Stephen Boxall, for example, remember he's the one that the principal inhabitants take to the sessions, was noted as a juror on the Frank Pledge Court in 1726. Stephen had been welcomed back, apparently, two years later. William Chitty was fined twice by the corporation, once for not appearing when called by the bailiff, bailiff and once for not serving the position of assistant to the warden to which he had been elected. So there's conflict within these groups then. 
A similar point might be made about those men bound to appear at the sessions for poaching or for trespass. Alongside Joshua Toff, cloth worker, the recognizance lists bricklayers, gardeners and a carpenter. Listed separately are another group of men with occupations such as clothier, fishmonger, cordwainer, weaver, molster, carpenter and gardener. To judge from these occupations, these men did not simply represent the labouring poor. Thomas Underwood was a church warden in 1724 and served on the Manor Court Baron in 1726. Caleb Tickner subscribed to the New Market House in 1729. We might remind ourselves at this point that the blacks were not a homogenous group of poor men either. Thompson identified many labourers but also craftsmen, tradesmen and many yeomen and farmers. It's tempting to see those men bound by the sessions for trespass in a pond as an organised protest. Why do 38 men, after all, trespass a pond? Thompson's account of social conflict in Wigs and Hunters integrates the breaking of fish ponds with deer hunting. Of offences in Windsor Forest of the Blacks between 1722 and 24, 14.9% were for fish ponds and 58.8% for deer hunting. These offences were, according to Thompson, actions against the property of the elite and royal rights and prerogatives on the part of protesters. These actions moved across the border between Hampshire and Surrey, and it was in fact in this area of, of Berkshire, Hampshire, uh, sorry, in this area of the Berkshire, Hampshire and Surrey county borders that Thompson saw the origins of the blacks. My argument is not that there were blacks in Godalming. There were no forests on which the Crown or the Whigs were encroaching. Um, and furthermore, John Borders noted that outside the Royal Forest, the actions and treatments of blacks were significantly different. There, the actions of the blacks were not reassertions of customary common rights and were dealt with through traditional and informal processes rather than the new Black Act. So we do need to attend to the specific nature of regions and settlements. It's very tempting to make a, a neat argument about the Toft hoax as protest, responding, for example, to the encroachment um, of landowners on uh, landowners' rabbits on common land, eating the food of the sheep and cattle that commoners and tenants grazed. Disputes over Warren rights were violent and long-standing on Cannock Chase, as Douglas Hay showed, of course. Unfortunately, I haven't found any disputes relating to rabbits or Warrens, though. Yet there were tensions in Godalming between the networks I've started to reconstruct, and in addition, the proximity of Godalming to the centre of the blacks would have been palpable to county governors. So, for example, um, I'm just wondering about timing, Tim. Would an hour be too long for me to talk? 55 minutes. 55 minutes. Okay. So, um, okay. So let me just skip on a little bit of the tensions in, in the town. And I just, just want to say a few words about, um, not now about the Toft network, which of course is Toft's conjugal um, family, but just a, a few words about her natal family, and that's the Denyers. Because the Denyers were of interest to these town governors. It's possible that Mary Toff's older brother, John Denyer, was the John Denyer accused of fathering the bastard child, uh, um, the bastard child of Sarah Pato, a 17-year-old, in the summer of 1720. Pato described how Denyer had frequently had carnal knowledge of her body in the house where she was a servant, and where, she implies, Denyer was a servant too. A John Denyer was recorded as being admitted into Godalming Hosp Hospital, the almshouses, in 1725. <coughs> Um, and this brings to, so he's in receipt of, of relief. This brings to mind a revealing detail in Mary Toff's first confession. In this, as I've said, Toff blames the hoax on a mysterious woman, the wife of a travelling knife grinder. She has come to Mary's house, Mary swore, because her brother owed her money. In this version of events, Mary implies that the hoax is driven by this debt of her brother. As with much of the content of these confessions, we need to be wary. But whether or not this is the literal truth, I think it is revealing of Mary's view of her family's circumstances. So Mary and Joshua Toft might be described not just part of the labouring poor, but as part of a vulnerable group who came under the scrutiny of those several forms of governments that I laid out earlier. Perhaps they were in receipt of parish relief. None of the records survive, unfortunately. 
These families were certainly of note for local office holders and those um, who, who, for whose authority extended across the county of Surrey. And in the year of the hoax, 1726, a series of cases came to the attention of these men that relate directly to the rabbit hoax. One particularly relevant case, the most relevant case, is that of Mary Cousins, committed to the Guildford House of Correction in March 1726. Mary had confessed to have made it her business to go about from parish to parish in the said county, extracting great sums of money from the parishes under pretense of her being near labour of childbearing. This case was heard just as Mary Toff was about to see rabbits in a field. The other two prisoners in Guildford Prison at this time, that's Easter 1727, included a man who'd been a loose and disorderly person and dangerous to the neighbourhood of Godalming, um, as well as another man who had been very loose, idle and disorderly. These examples show the ways in which the different authorities interlock to govern the intimate family lives and social behaviours of their local populations. All these individuals had been committed by Anthony Allen Esquire, one of the three signatories to the recognizance for trespass which brought Toft, Joshua Toft, to the Surrey Sessions in July 1726. And this allows me to move from Godalming to the wider county context. <coughs> I've already suggested how significant events in Surrey and indeed in neighbouring Hampshire and Berkshire were to the actions of both governors and the governed in Godalming. So let me now just talk about those governors in a bit more detail. So first, Anthony Allen, Esquire of Guildford, four miles from Godalming. Allen was not only familiar with the disorderly and criminal actions of the town and county, he'd also been their victim. In 1721, he was disturbed in his home by two men trying to steal his wig. As Marcia Poynton has put it, wigs represented both class and gender authority and loss of a man's wig caused, she says, a breakdown of the social order and the threat of unleashed sexual disturbance. And I had a lovely conversation with John Beattie a few, a few days ago. He said that I'd, I was over-reading the wig. <laughs> and I think he might be right, so I, I'm quoting Poynton there. Later that year, whilst in the Guildford pub, the Rose and Crown, one Francis Weston had accused the single woman Sarah Jones of having had an illegitimate a child by Anthony Allen Esquire, adding that Allen was an ass and a fool. <laughs> One could forgive Allen for feeling he was under threat. Thomas, second Baron Onslow, was another signatory to the recognizance for trespass, and so was familiar with the disorderly behaviour of Godalming inhabitants. As I've already mentioned, Onslow investigated the hoax case in Godalming and Guildford, finding those involved or who had information on the case and taking down those several depositions. Onslow's house, Clandon Park, very close to Guildford, was where those individuals were brought on the 3rd and 4th of December to give those statements. Moreover, Onslow was part of that group of Whig landowners who, according to Thompson, had suffered in their own parks, their deer, their fish or their family dignity at the hands of the blacks. And he too had personal experience of attacks. In September 1723, an attempt had been made on his life by a fellow with a gun on his shoulder, ready cocked. The case was tried and, and Edward Arnold, the defendant, found guilty and sentenced to death. The Wanslow interceded and the sentence of the execution was respited. A neat detail of the case of Edward Arnold's felony is that he was using the gun to shoot rabbits, which is neat for me. Arnold reportedly explained that Lord Onslow and King George had got all the money so that he could get none. Thompson discusses this case as one of two that had a huge impact on the application of the Black Act. This had, as I mentioned, been initially designed for men both armed and in disguise, but Arnold was prosecuted under this act despite not being in disguise. And I think Thompson's emphasis on the Black Act as a response in part to humiliation on the part of the authorities in the face of an apparent shift in social relations is very relevant. It's very relevant to the Toft case. Thompson said that this created an emotional crisis. This was an emergency acting upon the sensibility of such men. And the Act could only have been drawn up and enacted by men who had formed habits of mental distance and moral levity towards human life. Other local landowners were involved in the Toff case. As Thomas Clarges extracted Mary Toff's first two confessions in Lacey's Banyo, he was joined by the Dukes of Richmond and Montague. John, second Duke of Montague, was master of the Great Wardrobe <coughs> and Knight of the Order of the Bath. 
Charles Lennox, Duke of Richmond, was 26 when the case broke. Richmond had a house in Godalming, it was a convenient stopping off point between his country seat in West Sussex and London. In 1724, his steward recruited the services of Joshua Keane, carpenter in Godalming, for 17 days to undertake a large number of repairs, many of which were concerned with house security, as it happens. Duke, since 1723, he'd just been installed a Knight of the Garter, and as the case died down and following the accession of George II, he was a appointed High Constable of England and made a gentleman of the King's Bedchamber. He was a man still at the beginning of his dukedom and in the process of building a political career close to the monarchy and the Whig party elite. Neither man discussed the case in their surviving letters though, which are concerned with the Whig government and the royal court above all else. These men worked in counties but of course were oriented towards national politics and arguably both the uh, political and social situation of the 1720s was remarkable. Though Thompson stresses, stresses threats to property in his account of the Black Act, other historians have connected it directly to perceived Jacobite threats to the Crown and attempts to restore the Stuart line. David Lemmings has recently examined the newspaper of Walpole, the London Journal, including its coverage of the threats of the Jacobite conspiracy of 22 to 3 and the deer poachers. He argues that the paper created anxiety around these events as a conscious political endeavour, adding violent crime into the mix and relating this not just to Hampshire, which is where the blacks were, but also to London and Surrey and further afield. Moving from the Surrey context to London then, fears about both violent crime in London and the, the stability of the Hanoverian regime were rife in this period, of course. John Beattie has suggested that this is why, in Surrey, Tufts County, his sample period of 1722 to 4 saw the highest proportion of hangings to convictions. Beattie refers to these years as particularly vindictive in the criminal justice system. One particular concern was with female crime. Indeed, Beattie's suggestion is that men of the property classes were becoming particularly alarmed about women's uh, crime and anxious to bring women under control. The patterns of prosecutions that reflected anxieties about women, John Beatty points out, um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, I'll scrap that. Um, so Beatty's talking about a female crime wave that's con constituted by both significant increases in the proportion of prosecutions of women and commitments to the House of Correction, as well as, as people like Bob Shoemaker have shown, a new visibility of female criminals in print. And the representations of Toft, of course, are part of this visibility of female criminals in print. We can link this very directly, I think, these well-documented fears in 1720s London to the actions of Thomas Clarges, that JP who played a critical role, the critical role, I think, in bringing the case to its legal climax. JPs had wide-ranging powers that could be exercised at their discretion. It was he who took Mary into custody on the 4th of December and set in train the intensive few days that led to her confessions. His belligerence is commented upon by the doctors. Richard Manningham, who shows a complete disregard for Toff's feelings throughout the case, even Richard Manningham was forced to intercede on her behalf because she was so strictly examined by Clarges. Manningham skirts around this, giving a really euphemistic account of Clarges' violent treatment of her. He says, Sir Thomas threatened her severely and began to appear the most properest physician in her case, and his remedies took place and seemed to promise a perfect cure, for we heard no more of her former labour-like pains. It was Clarges who was most likely to be affected by the conditions affecting crime in Surrey and London, and his aggression, vindictiveness towards Toff may well have been prompted by his resulting attitudes towards the urban poor and crime. The Jacobite threats were, of course, a concern in London. Indeed, as Mary Toff resided in the Bridewell, the chairman of the Westminster Quarter Sessions, who'd presided over her case there, gave a loyal address to His Majesty on the theme of the threat to the Protestant religion. But he makes no reference to Toft. 
And this is typical of the relative silence on the political ramifications of the case, as opposed to earlier cases in which providence interacts with politics in very direct ways, and in particular in the Civil War monstrous births, which show God's unhappiness with one or other of the available positions in the conflict. William Burns is right that by the early 18th century, belief in the providential meaning of prodigies was defined as superstitious. There are changes certainly in how monstrous birth stories worked as political comment. Unlike earlier cases, the tough case is read differently, not allegorically for hidden symbolic, symbolic meaning, but literally for direct evidence of the unruly poor. And second, providence and monstrosity are disaggregated, but this does absolutely nothing to undermine the political significance of the case. Contemporaries did relate this case to broader public and political issues, situating Toft in the context of order and governance and religion not just medical thought. There was one other final crucial context for the case about which I can say very little, and that's the court of George I. Three of the doctors were linked either to George or the Prince and Princess of Wales. The apparent humiliation of the royal family must surely have been a driver in rooting out the truth of the case and, as David Lemmings has put it, of moral panics, as he calls them in this period, to ultimately neutralise unruly elements of the community. So was Toft neutralised? As she left the banyo for the bridewell, both she and John Howard, the Guildford doctor, were bound to appear at the Westminster sessions for, um, for the fraud of being delivered of 17 rabbits at 17 several times. Joshua Toff was bound to appear to give evidence against John Howard for the conspiracy. Elizabeth Williams, Toff's sister-in-law, and the Banyo servant were bound to appear to give evidence against Mary Toft for the cheat and imposture. The case then moved from the Westminster Sessions to King's Bench, where John Howard was due to appear. Quite how the case was handled at King's Bench has proved impossible to find. Despite the efforts of myself and Mary and A and other, this is the most interesting thing we found um, in King's Bench, a comment from a board clerk. <laughs> <laughs> that's my next project. Well, that's actually, it's actually a very old project. It appears... It appears that the cases against both Toft and Howard were simply dropped. Or perhaps Toft's recognizance and her confinement in the Westminster Bridewell for four months were deemed punishment enough. But in the end, no one was sure what to prosecute them for, Toft and Howard. Fraud by this time meant any fraudulent practice against which a man of common prudence could not reasonably defend himself. But it required a false token, such as false weights or dice. What would be the false token in this hoax? The rabbits. The law on cheats involved defrauding or endeavouring to defraud another of his known right by means of some artful device. But who were the losers and winners in this affair? The case includes several mentions of imagined gains for Toft and others, but as far as I can discern, no money ever changed hands and therefore there's no fraud. And that's one of the ironies of the case, of course. It arose within the context of a poor family, I think, intergenerational conflict, reproductive history, and a struggle to survive in an increasingly hostile social world in which such families were under growing scrutiny. If the interest of doctors stoked the flames, the case was very quickly being driven not by medical concerns, but by local, regional, and national governors who were already feeling threatened by the disorderly actions of some of those around them. A generation ago, John Brewer and John Stiles asked if the 18th century English, people like Mary and Joshua Toft were an ungovernable people. As Thompson and others showed, an element of that difficulty of governance and anxiety about it was the relationship between the English and their game. Amongst the profoundly troubling aspects of Mary Toft's monstrous births was, once again, that the people appeared ungovernable when it came to animals. Thank you very much.